This is part four of my Bible series on the sons of God and the daughters of men. In previous videos, we talked about the general theme of Genesis 6, 1 through 7. And we found that the sons of God are simply people who follow God. Well, today, we're going to focus on direct Bible evidence showing us that the phrase sons of God simply means followers of God. This phrase is really the reason that so many people are confused. If the writer had simply said the followers of God instead of the sons of God, then there really wouldn't be any confusion about Genesis 6, 1 through 7. Uh, many people believe that uh, the sons of God are aliens from outer space. That's actually a pretty popular view in some circles. Many people believe that the sons of God are angels. And we can talk about that uh, in the future. There's a lot of different beliefs about who these sons of God are. We're going to show very clearly that uh, the sons of God are simply people on earth who followed God. But the angels can also be called sons of God because they are obviously intelligent beings and they follow God. So, you know, both people on earth and the angels can be called sons of God. We'll talk about that more later. Some people believe that the sons of God are the sons of Seth and the daughters of men are the daughters of Cain. Well, to be honest, that doesn't really help people understand why that phrase sons of God is used. It does touch on the, the interpretation of Genesis 6, 1 through 7. It does give sort of a correct understanding, but you can't put people into, you can't pigeonhole them into you know, one family. You're not necessarily saved or lost based on the family that you come from or the race that you come from. So we're going to talk about what this phrase actually means. And the Bible defines itself. If you want to know what something means, you can go to other scriptures in the Bible. And that's what we're going to do right now. I'm going to start by quoting Old Testament scriptures. There's a lot of people that think that the New Testament doesn't apply to the Old Testament, and the Old Testament scriptures don't really apply to the New Testament. That's not really true, but a lot of people do teach that. So I'm going to start with Old Testament scriptures because Genesis 6, 1 through 7, is an Old Testament passage. Hosea 1, verse 10 says, Yet the number of children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea which cannot be measured nor numbered, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. So this is obviously talking about Israelites, and it's referring to them as the sons of the living God. Now, this is obviously talking about something that will happen in the future, but... Uh, Read Deuteronomy 32, verse 19. And when the Lord saw it, he had poured them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. So, again, the Israelites are referred to as God's sons and daughters. Uh, read Isaiah 43, verses 5 through 7. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far, and my daughters from the ends of the earth, even every one that is called by my name. For I have created him from my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. So when you look at these three verses, it seems that God is referring to his people, and I assume that this is talking about earthly people, as his sons and his daughters. So if we have these Old Testament passages that tell us that we can be his sons and daughters, then it is possible that the phrase sons of God in uh, Genesis 6, 1 through 7 is referring to simply people who followed God on earth, not angels or aliens. So now let's go into the New Testament because in the New Testament, there's quite a few verses that tell us uh, what this phrase means. And to be honest with you, the phrase sons of God is really a, a, a metaphor. It's a metaphorical phrase. It's not literal. It's just telling us that we are given the honor of holding positions which are equal to 
or equivalent to sons and daughters of God. If we look at Revelation 21, verse 7, it says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So there it is, right there, right in front of us. This is God speaking. And he is telling us that if we overcometh, we shall not only inherit all things, but we will be the sons of God. So if God tells us that by his own words, it's hard to argue against the idea that people on earth can be referred to as the sons or daughters of God. Uh, let's look at some other verses here. John chapter 1 verses 12 through 13. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So John is telling us that we can become the sons of God. We, being mortal men or women, can be the children of God. Romans 8, verses 14 through 21, Paul says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then hears, hears of God and joint hears with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Now I say that the here, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an hear of God through Christ. So there's Paul again telling us that we can become the sons and daughters of God. Philippians 2, verses 14 through 15, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Jesus referred to a woman as daughter. Luke 8, verse 48, Daughter, be of good comfort, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1-2 through 2, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. So as you can see, that phrase is used quite a bit. It's metaphorical. We're not the literal sons of God in the same way that we are, you know, the sons and daughters of our parents, but we are given uh, that title and we are adopted into the holy family of the Lord. Now, I do want to mention that Jesus is called the only begotten son of God. Notice it says only begotten son. If you look at the chronologies, you see that it uses the word begat when it talks about somebody having children. So-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so. And that word just means that a person was descended from another person. 
So when Jesus is called the only begotten Son of God, that means that he was actually descended from God. Now again, you can't take that too far. It, it's metaphorical to a certain extent. But what that means is we are adopted, as Paul told us. We are uh, sons of God, those who follow God, and those uh, women who follow God are daughters of God. But Jesus was not adopted. He, well, he had the Spirit of God from the time that he was conceived. So that's why he is called the only begotten Son of God, because he was actually begotten, in a sense, by God. Whereas we were born with ignorance of God, but we had to gain the knowledge of God. This is the whole idea of being born again. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, verses 3 through 6 and 9 through 10, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? You see, many people believe that if somebody is a Jewish scholar or a great Christian preacher, then they just automatically know everything. But oftentimes, some of the most educated and schooled people don't really know some of the most important concepts. And this idea of who the sons of God are and who the daughters of men are is, I think, one of those topics because this is something that is just not well known. Many people understand the basic idea of what it means to be born again, but they have trouble uh, explaining it. Jesus said in Matthew 18, verse 3, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's telling us that we probably need to humble ourselves in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But notice it uses this term children to describe those who follow God, which means the same thing as the phrase sons of God. Matthew 12 verses 46 through 50, Matthew says, While Jesus talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But Jesus answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. So this shows us that those who follow God are in the family of God. Now, the phrase children of God is also used in the Bible. And even though the word children is uh, different than the word sons, it means the same thing. We read Hosea chapter 1 verse 10. It said, And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. That's the Old Testament. But then Paul quotes that passage, that, that verse, in Romans 9 26 and he says the same thing and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them ye are not my people there shall they be called the children of the living God so Paul is obviously quoting from Hosea either consciously or unconsciously but instead of saying the sons of the living God he says the children of the living God obviously it means the same thing Hebrews 2 verses 10 through 13 and 17 for it became him, that is Jesus, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. 
for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me, wherefore in all things it behoved him, Jesus, to be made like unto his brethren. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Think about that. Those who follow God are called the children of God. That was Matthew 5, verse 9. Luke 6, 35, But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Luke 20, verses 34 through 36, The children of this world marry, and are given in marriage. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die any more. For they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Now some people might take that to say, well see, that shows that you have to be an angel in order to be a, ch a child of God. But again, uh, if you're an intelligent being who follows God, most likely you're going to be called a son or daughter of God or a child of God. It doesn't make a difference if you're an angel or just a, a mere mortal person. Galatians 3, verse 26, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So Paul is making it very simple for us. Ephesians 1, verse 5, God predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Notice it says that we are adopted. 1 John 3, verses 9 through 10, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So, notice it's talking about the children of the devil and the children of God. Again, this is metaphorical language. Um, anybody who follows the work of the devil is not literally a child of the devil. It's a metaphorical phrase. 1 John chapter 5, verse 2 by this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. Job 21 verse 19, Job says, God layeth up his iniquity for his children. He rewardeth him, and he shall know it. So again, this terminology appears all over the place in the Bible. It's just everywhere. And we also have verses where God is talking to the disciples, and he refers to God as your father. For example, Matthew 5, verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven. Now think about this. If God is referred to as your father, what does that make you? Obviously it makes you one of his sons or daughters. So we have many, many verses that we could quote where God is referred to as Father, I'm not going to bore you by quoting you know, every single verse, but we also have verses in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 32, verse 6, Do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy Father that hath bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? So God is referred to as Father. Malachi 2, verse 10, have we not all one Father? So, again, this verse is referring to God as Father. So if God is our Father, then that would mean we are sons and daughters of God. Now, we can see this type of uh, metaphorical terminology in other places in the Bible. And to this day, we still use this type of terminology. You might hear an old man say, Hey, Sonny. Well, He's referring to somebody as his son, but is he really a blood relation? No, it's just a it's just a a type of language that we often use even to this day. One phrase that is not not such a good phrase that uh, somebody should call you this, but uh, 
it's the phrase the sons of Belial. Now Belial apparently is a, another word for basically the enemy, the devil, uh, somebody who is uh, evil. 1 Samuel 2 verse 12 says, Now the sons of Eli were the sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. Now when you first read this, you might think, Oh, well, these, uh, these people are descended from some guy named Belial. Well, actually, no, they're descended from Eli. Uh, but they were called the sons of Belial because they were evil. They didn't know the Lord. They weren't literally the sons of Belial. Belial, again, is just another word for basically the devil. So when somebody was called the son of Belial, it wasn't literal. It meant that those people followed the works of Belial. We have many verses in the Old Testament uh, that uses a phrase or some uh, variation of this phrase. Second Chronicles 13, verse 7, And there gathered unto him vain men, the children of Belial. Judges 19:22. Now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about, and beat at the door, and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house, that we may know him. So these were men that were going to basically rape some stranger, and they were called sons of Belial. This is the incident that led to the destruction of the tribe of Benjamin. Deuteronomy 13, verses 12 through 15, If thou shalt hear say in one of the cities which the Lord thy God hath given thee to dwell there, saying, Certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you, and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which ye have not known. Then shalt thou inquire, and make search, and ask diligently, and behold, if it be truth, and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought among you, Thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly and all that is therein, and the cattle thereof with the edge of the sword. So again, these people who were evil were referred to as the sons or the children of Belial. Another phrase that you can hear is the, the phrase sons of the prophets. And again, the whole purpose of, of talking about these phrases is to show people that the phrase sons of God simply means people who follow God in the same way that the phrase sons of Belial means people who followed Belial. You see the phrase sons of the prophets in the Old Testament. Well, who were the sons of, prof of the prophets? They were people who followed the prophets. That's all this terminology means. It's not supposed to be some everlasting mystery. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. Elisha was a great prophet of God. So through the context of this, you can see that this man who died was a follower of the prophets. And because he followed the prophets and sat at the feet of the prophets and learned from the prophets, he was called a man of the sons of the prophets. He wasn't literally a son of a prophet. He was just called a son of a prophet or a son of the prophets because he followed the prophets. Second Kings chapter 4, verse 38, And Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was a darth in the land, and the sons of the prophets were sitting before him. So why are these men sitting before him called the sons of the prophets? Is it because they're literally descended from prophets? Probably not. They're called the sons of the prophets because they sat at the feet of the prophets. 2 Kings 6, verses 1 through 2, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us, meaning uncomfortable. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. So these people are sitting at the feet of Elisha to learn from him, and they're called the sons of the prophets. So they were not, again, the literal sons of the prophets. They were people who followed the prophets and sat at their feet to learn from them, and they were called the sons of the prophets. Second Kings chapter 2, verses 15 through 16. And when the sons of the prophets which were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him, and bowed themselves to the ground before him. And they said unto him, Behold, now, 
There be with thy servants fifty strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master, lest peradventure the Spirit of the Lord have taken him up, and cast him upon a mountain or into some valley. So these men were respectful to Elisha, and they were called uh, the sons of the prophets. So we've given many places in the Bible where this type of metaphorical speech is used. And there are many other places in the Bible. And I could bore you by giving you just verse after verse after verse after verse. Um, we already mentioned that uh, sometimes the, the Pharisees and the chief priests were called the sons of the devil. Jesus referred to them that way because they were not the literal sons of the devil, but they followed the works of the devil. And uh, some people are called the sons of uh, Paul and the sons of, of John because they followed, the, they followed John and Paul. And Elisha had many people that uh, followed him. Elisha was a great prophet, and the people of Israel respected him. We find in uh, Second Kings that even some of the leaders in the surrounding areas respected Elisha to the point where they referred to themselves as his son. In 2 Kings chapter 8, 7 through 9, it says, Elisha came to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, was sick. And it was told him, saying, The man of God is come hither. And the king said unto Hazel, Take a present in thine hand, and go, meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? So Hazel went to meet him, and said, Thy son Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, has sent me to thee, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? So even the king of Syria, because he respected Elisha, he referred to himself as a son of Elisha. He was not literally the father of King Ben-Hadad. Uh, but again, this shows this type of terminology. 2 Kings 6, verses 20 through 21, And it came to pass, when they were coming to Samaria, and Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men, that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, when he saw them, My father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? Notice that he refers to Elisha as his father. Well, Elisha was not the literal father of the king of Israel. But because the king of Israel respected Elisha so much, he called him father. Again, you see this type of terminology throughout the Bible. 2 Kings 13, verse 14, Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. So again, we have another king of Israel who's referring to Elisha as father. He was not his literal father. He gave him this honorary title. So, as you can see, this terminology is used again and again. It's metaphorical terminology. And if you want to really understand the Bible, you're going to have to understand what this uh, terminology means. When Jesus is called the only begotten Son of God, you're going to have to understand what that means. Uh, when the Bible refers to people as sons of God, you're going to have to understand what that means. And uh, the phrase sons of Belial and sons of the prophets, these are all things that you need to have some sort of an understanding of what these phrases actually mean. So this was part four of my Bible series. We talked about the main point of Genesis 6, 1 through 7, which is marriage. But today we talked about the phrase sons of God and what it really means. Um, it's not referring to aliens from outer space or angels coming down and having relations with women. Most likely it's simply referring to people who chose to follow God. And these people integrated themselves with people who didn't follow God. And in doing so, they lost their ability to retain the knowledge of God and this is really one of the key themes in the history of the world. We learned in previous videos that uh, this is how Israel fell apart. This is why Israel was destroyed. Because they 
integrated the pagans, the Zidonians and the Edomites and the Hittites and the, uh, the various Canaanites, uh, the Moabites and the, uh, uh, the Ammonites and all these different people, they integrated into their families and these people didn't know God, didn't care about God, and they uh, committed all kinds of evil and they raised up children who also committed all kinds of evil until Israel just fell apart. So in part five of this Bible series, we're going to probably wrap this up. We could just go on and on and on for, for many, many videos. But again, at this point, you should have the, the basic idea of what Genesis 6 really means. Um, I'm going to make a, uh, a document available to you so that you can go over every single scripture and research this to the extent that you need to uh, be convinced if you want to have the scriptures that are there. But in the next video, we're going to explain how we can use this, this interpretation and this uh, understanding to uh, find the meaning of other passages in the Bible, even uh, Revelation 14. So I'll look forward to seeing you in the next video.